Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York. And since Allison Mark and Powell will be part of today's conversation about translator communities, uh, our co-host today is Marianne Newman, a leading translator from Catalan and Spanish and the organizer and curator of New York's annual St. Jordi Festival, among many other events. Marianne is also a co-organizer of Translating the Future, the conference you are now attending. On May 19, in the second week of this conference, the immensely talented writer and translator Nina Munzer joined us from Beirut for an unforgettable conversation with Madhu Kaza. As you know, last week, a catastrophic explosion occurred all the great city of Beirut. During today's conversation, Marshall explained specific suggestions for actions to take in support of that city and its people. For those seeking more insight into Beirut's history and current situation, we strongly recommend the work of Lena Munzer. The two editorials of hers that appeared on the op-ed page of the New York Times prior to and following the explosion, her August 9 piece in The Guardian about its aftermath, and Waste Away, her extraordinary essay published in July by The Battler. First, I'd like to thank um, Alison Markenpel and Esther Allen for inviting me to be part of this. I, uh, this amazing series of, of conversations about translation. It's, it's really an honor. Um, in Lina Munzer's August 5th article in the New York Times, immediately following the explosion, she movingly and angrily evoked the impact of explosions in Lebanese history. I'm quoting her now. Growing up in Lebanon taught me that an explosion resonates across time, that the shock reverberates forward into your life and the pressure reconfigures the landscape of the mind. The people of Beirut have been shaped by the bombs that reconfigured this country. Beneath the rubble, beneath the sadness, an immense rage has begun to boil. Lebanese blood has been spilled for so long. After the war, the criminals all granted themselves amnesty. This time, it won't be theirs for the taking." Close quote. In this spirit of resistance, we salute the courage and strength of the citizens of Beirut and encourage everyone to choose a way to express their solidarity and collaboration with them. Communities of mutual aid are the subject of today's conversation in what is the 14th installment of our weekly program. Today's group is particularly far flung. Paige Anaya Morris, a writer, translator, and co-founder of the platform Disoriented.blog, joins us from Seoul. Shuchi Saraswat, a writer and reading series director, is in Boston. And M. Links Quayle, writer, translator, and founder of the translation community website, ArabLid.org, comes to us from Rabat, Morocco. They are joined by Alison Mark and Powell for a conversation about building translator communities and communities for translation. You can learn more about all of today's wonderful speakers by reading their full bios on the Center for the Humanities site. Following today's conversation, there will be time for questions. Please email your questions for Paige, Shuchi, MLQ, and Allison to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. Translating the Future will continue in its current form through September. And towards the end of that month, during the conference's originally planned dates, several larger scale events will take place. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with the week's hour long conversation. Please join us next Tuesday, August 18, at our regular 1.30 hour for the third and final Motherless Tongues Multiple Belongings program with Janet Hong, Pierre Joris, and Maria Jose Jimenez. And do keep checking the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translated the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn Miller-Lachman 
and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at pen.org. I am particularly happy to mention this in the context of today's topic, because for many of us, the Penn Translation Committee is our core community. If you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream today, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Allison and the gang, we'd like to offer our utmost gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Kalman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and Penn America and to the masters of dark Zoom magic at HowlRound who make this live stream possible. And for their special support for today's program in particular, we'd like to thank the Middlebury Language Schools and LTI Korea. And now over to you guys. Hello everyone. It's so exciting to be here. This, uh, this panel is very meaningful to me because uh, as Marianne and Esther suggested, the Penn Translation Committee has for some time been uh, the sort of source of my translation community, which has branched out into uh, and inspired various other communities. Um, but also speaking of that, I would like to ask MLQ, if she would like, if she would be able to share a little bit more about ways in which we and, and, and our audience might be able to help those in Lebanon. Right. And I, I think, uh, as many people already know, Lebanon was already deep in an economic crisis before this began. Um, and the needs right now are very immediate. And so if uh, the biggest thing to do is if you have any sort of extra money whatsoever is to, to donate it to things, ideally things that are on the ground and things that are happening lo locally. I don't think there's any wrong place to donate unless you're planning to give money directly to the Lebanese government, in which case don't. Um, but it, it, there are bookshops that are uh, fundraising to, um, to, to reopen such as Paper Cup and Manara. Uh, there are um, studios, there are all sorts of things. The Lebanese Red Cross, Lebanese Food Bank. Ideally, if you can give to somebody who you know is traveling soon so they can bring cash with them. But otherwise, any, anything that's going on on the ground, such as Lebanese Red Cross, Lebanese Food Bank is uh, excellent. There, there are a list of, of things at arablit.org if people wanna go look there. Wonderful, thank you very much. So to begin our conversation, I um, I thought that maybe each of us could speak a little bit at first about the communities that we each have created. And um, I guess I would be glad to start. Uh, today, I think the main communities that I would be talking about are, um, I'm, was, I'm honored to be a part of, to be founding member of two different translation collectives or translator collectives, I should say. One of them is Sidilla and Company and the other is called Strong Women Soft Power. So this was, I believe back in early 2016, it just, they both came together right around the same time. And I think there was a collective moment happening at that point in time for me personally and in the, in the ether, I think. Um, so, I need to give credit to Sean Bai and Julia Sanchez, who were the, uh, who had the original idea for Sedilla and Company, and they invited me and certain other members to become founding members of that. And that's a translation collective, a translators collective based um, in America. It was primarily based in New York and with translators of various languages. And we wanted to be sort of a mutual support organization in, in service to the publishing community, but also in service to ourselves, offering each other support. And at the same time, so that that was coming together, I was uh, in conversations and connections with two other women who translate Japanese literature, uh, Lucy North, who lives in the UK and Ginny Tapli Takemori, who lives in Japan. And we were coming together over 
various topics and uh, we all happened to be going to the London Book Fair uh, that year. And so we organized our first event, which was a reading, which we, we gave the reading our title, our name, Strong Women, Soft Power. And so we came together, um, the idea was to support or to promote Japanese women writers in translation in English. And because we sort of saw there a, to be a need for that um, in terms of works in translation. And then we also felt that um, women translators were um, not getting the same opportunities. So we wanted to, um, to support ourselves, but also bring attention to that in within the translation community. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that and I'm gonna pass it on maybe to Paige now, if you'd like to tell us a bit about how you're here. Sure. Uh, yeah, so the community I'll be talking about today is disoriented.blog, which is a blog platform that was founded to uh, create a space for people to think through transnational lives and identities, essentially lives in transit between Asia and the US. Uh, and how the community came about, uh, I was in Korea a few years ago as a Fulbright grantee. And I realized during my first grant year that a lot of us were coming from the context of the US, perhaps it was our first time out of the US. Um, and we were discovering that we were having very interesting experiences related to our identities that we were struggling to find the language to name and discuss. Uh, so we had a lot of soul searching conversations basically about, um, you know, for, for myself coming from the US as a black American living in Korea and sort of having to rediscover or renegotiate what it means to move through a space as a black person in the US as opposed to Korea um, and trying to find ways to talk about that experience and just feeling that um, there were maybe other people having similar encounters and grappling with similar questions uh, led me and some of the other grantees I was in conversation with to think that uh, maybe a platform for that kind of conversation on a more global scale would be really helpful. Uh, so we founded the blog sort of just as a project of kind of calling on anyone who is living this just muddled transnational life uh, to submit writing, art, any media that they felt they could use to ask those questions and struggle toward answers and maybe not arrive at answers. But um, we found that a, it didn't begin as a, a translation project, so to speak. But I think the questions we were asking uh, kind of naturally uh, gave way to multilingual and multimedia ways of asking and, and grappling with those questions. So in the end, the blog uh, now contains several languages, several countries represented several types of experiences in transit. Um, and I think that's really exciting and it was really overwhelming, but really uh, comforting to see how many people were interested in participating in this conversation and interested in what it means to kind of live these lives um, where we're uprooted from certain contexts and planted in others and just trying to make sense of it with whatever language we have at that moment. Yeah, I, I will pass on the torch to uh, Shuchi. <laughs> and thank you, Alison, for putting this group together. I'm really honored to be, to be in this conversation with you all. Um, so I, um, the communities I'm talking about are um, the book selling communities. Um, I work at a bookstore and, and how to reach readers um, and and kind of, I guess, I'm not a translator, so opening up um, the world of translation to communities that are not familiar with translation. Um, so in 2018, I founded um, a author event series called the Transnational Literature Series. And that was really focused on the theme of migration um, and works in translation naturally fell into, into that kind of, you know, that theme, but it wasn't until later that year um, after I attended BU's Translation Now conference that I thought 
the conversations translators were having were really, um, really enmeshed with what the series themes were about. Um, considering, you know, kind of decentering the American experience was one of the big things that we were trying to do with the series. Um, and that's something that translators are facilitating um, through bringing various works in and, and looking at um, how we use language um, and, and sort of the stories and the way stories are told in the US and how can we kind of open that up. Um, and then of course, you know, just the, the business of translation and um, and how hard it is to get translation published in the US. And so all of these conversations really felt like they were um, in kinship with um, what was going on in the series. And so I started to um, bring translators more into the conversation in a variety of ways, um, which we'll talk about later. But um, that's that's basically the angle that I'm, I'm here, you know, kind of representing is sort of how do we how do we bring this work um, that you're all doing to to larger communities and, and make them aware of it. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll pass it on to MLQ. Okay, so um, I guess the, uh, the the core of the community that I, uh, I'm going to be talking about is Arab Lit, which started out as a, a WordPress blog in 2009. And although I've been asked about it several times, only, you know, after many, many years had passed and I no longer quite remember why I opened it up. I know I had a new baby and I was freelancing at home and I was probably lonely. <laughs> but when I did open it up and I started to post just kind of thoughts about Arabic literature and translation and micro reviews, I found immediately that I was contacted by, um, by translators, uh, Arabic to English first and then really uh, very quickly, English to Arabic translators as well from uh, around the region and around the world. Uh, so I think there was really sort of this untapped need for a communal space and for a community in a very cross-cutting way. So um, it's, it's now not, not a community, the, the translators are the core of the community in both, uh, in multiple directions um, in and out of Arabic. But it's also Arab publishers, um, Anglophone publishers who are interested in Arabic literature, Italian publishers who are interested in Arabic literature and read in English. Um, and it's, you know, got um, Arab Kid Lit Now now, which is a, a, a children's aspect to it well, which involves Arabic children's publishing. Um, and, and I think what I've enjoyed the most about this community and there are a, a sort of a number of things you know we had this um, uh, Arabic translation challenge recently that ran for seven weeks where we threw out poetry and people uh, translated it in different ways and often amusing ways um, because you know translation is often something that you do sort of in your home particularly in this corona time um, without seeing other other humans um, and I, I freelance in a number of different ways and it's all you know, right here in this room. Um, but one, the thing I think that has worked the best about this community is that um, for Arabic to English translation, um, there are a lot of people who are really brilliant at it who are not in, in the United States or England, who don't have access to uh, the journals, don't know how to access publishers at all, who do beautiful work, um, but don't have, uh, any access to the sort of Anglophone publishing or professional or have the citizenship to belong to any institution uh, or residency or anything. And, and it has been sort of helping people uh, work on pitch letters and I mean, really bumbling along, I guess, together, <laughs> uh, making connections between people, sharing my contacts with people, helping people who wanted to translate and who do beautiful work uh, find their way to into publishing. Um, so I think you know, sort of the Arab lit community is all sorts of different people who are interested in literature and moving how it moves between languages. Yeah. All right. That's. I mean, it's, this is just. It's so amazing to hear from each of you and to hear about this. I mean, one of the reasons that I brought this group together is I think because I felt like 
there's something about the, the field or if you even want to call it a field or an industry of literary translation, it's not, it's not really centralized. It's not really organized. And yet we are all, you know, striving and struggling to make it and to create literature and to get it into the hands of readers. And so I think, you know, I, I personally came to literary translation, translating Japanese literature, working through publishing. I'm not an academic, but I think, and so academia does offer a certain kind of structure, but I think what I, no, what I noticed or what I felt about each of these you here today is that like you saw a need or you saw something that you wanted to exist and you created it and it worked. People, were attracted to it, you know, obviously it was something that, you know, you, it wasn't, you know, you weren't, it wasn't just in the void, you know, something that, that happened, like I said, you know, my collectives both happened at the same times and they filled different needs. And so um, that's what, something that I would like to talk about, but, um, you know, one of the things like MLQ you were referring to is the sort of precarity. I mean, because of this lack of structure, you know, I think we all and, you know, booksellers are in a very precarious moment as well. But um, there is a lot of precarity for literary translators, particularly those who don't have jobs, other kind, don't have full time jobs who are doing this as a primary as their profession. So um, MLQ, did you want to speak? Would you be able to yeah, speak? I am one of those people who doesn't have a job. <laughs> I, do have, I have a lot of jobs, but not not a one job. Um, and, and that is so, when, when I think about creating community around um, Arab and Arabic literature and translation, there are, there are so many communities inside the community um, and different needs and different access and different authority. So there are, there are translators who uh, live in the United States who are tenured professors or, or in Canada or, or in the UK and who have uh, you know, this sort of in, in immediate authority um, or, or, or there's, you know, there are other ways of course to gain authority. Jonathan Wright um, who came to translation through being a Reuters, for, after being a Reuters journalist. But there are, there are people who have this sort of um, settled life and they do translation as part of what they do. Um, and that's one translation community, and um, and you know they're an important part of the translation community, and they can help the broader translation community in many ways. Um, there's another part of the translation community who is um, like me, who's uh, um, freelancing full time and supporting oneself, one's family, sometimes one's extended family, um, and then there is our different. Uh, different still kinds of other precarities, you know, um, a, a translator living in Beirut right now, who is also trying to uh, support their family and, you know, while inflation is going out of control and they don't have any windows. Um, so this is a, a broad community with all kinds of different access, authority, um, financial precarity or, or not. Um, and, and so around some issues, it becomes very easy to build community, right? Like some things, the Arabic translation challenge is fun. Anybody wants to do it, no matter what their, you know, financial position is today. Um, uh, joining, being part of the magazine that we spawned out of it, uh, to me, it was so important that we pay writers and translators because, um, because some people can afford to participate in a magazine that where you're donating your labor um, uh, and some people cannot. And, and it, it, uh, I was recently speaking um, before the events of August 4th with, with Rima Rantisi, who, is, who does something similar to um, Arab Lit Quarterly in, in Beirut, which is a magazine called Rusted Radishes that moves between Arabic and, and English. And she'd said her reaction to things becoming more and more precarious in Beirut was that they wanted to create uh, paid positions for people that they wanted to, to try and, you know, sort of put something around to, to protect people, to, to support people for, for doing their work, this work and this important work in the arts. Um, and I think, uh, you know, I never imagined myself as sort of a, a zine photocopying 
teenager, like worrying about bank transfers and and paying right, you know, paying translators. I mean, that sounds so like grown up and boring, but I I think there is something you know radical also to to paying people uh, to be part of this community, um, and then you know if, sometimes of course people who have these uh, uh, positions where they don't need to be paid, they can donate it back to the magazine as well. But so, but but it does make uh, creating community sometimes harder um, because with people who are precarious and people who are not, they have different interests and don't necessarily. So for instance, if you um, an, publishing translations with a, uh, a university press, they usually don't pay uh, anything at all. <laughs> And for an academic, this may be fine. Um, you know, you spent uh, whatever a year working on this translation. Uh, it can be important to you in other ways. Obviously, none of us are wholly driven by the financial aspect, but for many of us, we we can't just translate a book and then give it away for free as a regular practice. Um, and and there's sort of you know different. Um, uh, so there's all sorts of different entry points. It's it's a wonderful thing that that sort of you don't need a certificate, you don't need uh, um, you don't need any you know um, you don't need to join a board or a group in order to become a literary translator. But there are all kinds of levels of belonging in in the in the industry, and and I think this was something that Paige can really speak to in terms of gatekeeping and breaking into the industry and what the different kind of levels of barrier to entry are. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, MLQ. I think a lot of what you talked about is especially salient um, to me as, you know, I consider myself definitely a new emerging, all of the sort of novice words for a translator. And, you know, I'm only really able to comfortably call myself a translator because of these opportunities, right, for, you know, getting paid to do this work and being taken seriously and um, having your work seen as valuable. Um, I think a lot of the barriers that you described definitely would have kept me out of uh, this industry and out of doing this work just because, you know, there are only so many people who can afford to do it for free or who have access to the sort of rooms where a lot of these decisions are made. I think, you know, as someone who I also am a writer and also uh, had an interest in working in, in publishing in an editorial capacity, I see a lot of the same barriers to entry uh, in translation as a part, as a wing of the publishing industry. And I think there's a clear investment in, in maintaining those barriers in a lot of ways. And that's really why we often see the need to make our own communities and to sort of work around the barriers to entry. Um, I think obviously a lot of publishing and a lot of, you know, professionally translating is who you know and, you know, who your circles are and who who do you have who will be a person who can, you know, rope you into the, the correct space or rope you into the correct opportunity or room. And, you know, I've just been so fortunate in my, you know, very brief, but, you know, hopefully long tenure as a translator to have encountered a lot of individuals um, rather than, you know, very large industry-wide institutions. I've often found that it's those individual gestures of outreach that have really made a huge difference for me. I don't feel that I can say I belong to something that feels coherent as a community, but I feel that at every step of you know my career so far, there's been someone who has you know done that work of reaching out and inviting me into spaces, conversations. You know, thank you to Allison again for inviting me into this conversation and this space. Um, and those sorts of interactions can make all the difference. I, I remember just this year was my first uh, translation reading. Um, and that all came about because it just took one person to introduce me to another person who happened to be organizing a local reading series and then remembered me and, you know, sent an email and 
just like that, you know, I was brought into the space by one person, um, right? I'll, I want to thank uh, Sam Bett, who translates from Japanese as well, um, who hosts the Us and Them reading series in Brooklyn and, you know, just brought me into this small indie bookstore in Brooklyn one night. And, you know, people who were in that room and who I was able to share this work with, they, you know, are still in touch. And, and I think that created a community, you know, however, transcendent it may seem to have like a kind of one night reading I think those are like lasting examples of community that can come from just individual gestures and the work that so many individuals do to create these spaces um, and I mean I'm especially curious to hear from from the book selling end of it from Shuchi like what you think about when you are organizing a reading series or organizing events in your bookstore um, how do you think about those in terms of community and how do you, how does that work, you know, operate when you're trying to bring in translators and translated writing? Yeah, well, I mean, I think what you said about um, meeting someone and, and what they can do in, in, as far as opening up community, um, that's, that's so much of what was happening at the beginning of the series was I was trying to find these communities that were um, talking about literature in this sort of deep way in a very transnational way. And um, I actually found out about the Translation Now conference at Boston University from um, Stacey Mattingly, who had been coming to the transnational events and helped organize that. So it was sort of meeting her through the events that she had been attending um, as just an audience member and expressing, she expressed interest in this is, this is really great and I'm not seeing this kind of work. And then keeping that line of communication open and, um, and then just realizing, you know, Boston University is just a mile or so from Brookline Booksmith. I mean, really, we're really close to each other. And yet, even in the city, and I think this happens a lot in cities, um, we just kind of stay within our own communities and we don't intersect. And then the second you open it up, I mean, the views conference was open to the public, you know, and, and I had realized that I didn't know that. And so I have this very lucky position of being in a bookstore. Um, Brooklyn Booksmith's been around for almost 60 years. So it's really established within, um, within Brookline um, and greater Boston. And so I have access to a public space. Um, and that I think is really, is really valuable. And, and especially the last few years um, under Trump's presidency, I've understood the value of having this pub public respected platform and how that can be used in new ways and how important it is that those platforms are used in new ways. Um, and so I really wanted to break out of this, this sort of, I don't, I want us to do something different and new. And it was necessary that I started having conversations with people who are already doing this. Um, so talking to the Good to Institute was important. You know, um, we, the um, cultural, the uh, France, the French Cultural Center, um, they've been doing so much. So all of these communities were already doing so much in Boston. And it was like, well, how can we help? First of all, you know, how can we how can we bring what you're doing to our community and how can we sort of offer our space up to what you're doing as well? Um, and so I guess with with incorporating translators, um, it was such an experiment. There was sort of nobody who had been doing this in a reading series format. Um, so we tried a lot of different things. Um, we you know, we did a New England translators panel. Um, and that was um, sort of a great first step because we were able to find translators locally in the community. And so that opened it up to um, students who are interested in translation and, and friends with translators. And that brought out the kind of natural communities um, and introduced them to the store and to this series and saw, hey, this is a place that's welcoming um, this kind of conversation. Um, we also, I mean, you know, so much has changed, of course, since the pandemic. So we were really fixed to our space. Um, and of course, with virtual events, that, that's kind of opened up in a whole new way. Um, but, you know, we were, we were, when we were able to have authors and translators together in conversation, that was always really wonderful, too, to see um, how two people work together on a book. Um, and so having Gabriela Alamon in conversation with Dick, um, Dick Well, Dick I believe, I'm sorry if I'm forgetting his name. Um, they were, they read back and forth from the Spanish and the English and the Spanish and the English. And then it was just this completely new, different kind of reading that we hadn't even thought could happen. I mean, they were they were alternating paragraphs. And yet everybody 
followed and understood what was happening. And it was so amazing to just see, wow, that we can even do this reading in a whole different kind of way. Um, and, and then we've been doing um, sort of, you know, gathering um, translators in a particular language, um, which Allison knows she was part of our translating Japanese panel. Um, and I think what that does is, is framing it in that particular way. It brings in people who are um, interested in Japan. Um, it brings in people who are interested in Japanese literature. It was a chance for us to talk about um, general ideas of what Japanese literature is and how to break out beyond that. Um, so I think it was finding these ways to kind of, to be really, we were being really flexible and open, what works, what doesn't. Um, you know, translators can, are, are sometimes the most fiercest advocates of, of the book that um, has been brought into English. And so um, they're more than happy to be a part of these conversations and to, to realize that and to, and to keep as many lines of communication open, um, learning about the collectives um, has been part of that too. Um, so yeah, I think I think you know um, just kind of opening opening up ideas of what we can do and, and how we can embrace new communities has been has been really important um, and especially in this time um, where we're sort of you know the last couple of months where we're thinking about systems and how to break open from systems um, that have been established. Um, I want to kind of turn it back to you, MLQs, and actually all of you to talk about about how you kind of have to, what are the challenges you, you face systemically with being a translator and how do you break outside of that? Um, Cause that seems really important to, to kind of start talking about now. <laughs> right, well the, I mean, the challenges systemically for, for Arabic literature and translation are sort of <laughs> many. Um, there, you know, there's the challenge of, of sort of, yeah, you can easily become a part of this, this group somehow, you know, you can, you know somebody, you know a writer, you love their work, you, you translate it, you publish it somewhere, you're a translator, right? Um, uh, but in terms of finding a way to get inside the group, um, it, it's, it's, it's very difficult. Um, and then, Arabic itself, of course, is sort of on the margins. So to get inside of the in-group that's already at the margins is, <laughs> then you're still at the margins in terms of uh, getting work brought into English or other languages. Um, and, you know, Arabic is just, I think, reaching a point where you're more likely to see the work read Okay, not more likely. You sometimes are seeing the work read in a really literary way versus just in an ethnographic, you know, um, behind the veil. Uh, this is a story of a woman escaping, blah, 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 and reaching America. Uh, you know, this sort of um, gloss put on. Uh, so the, and then, so there are systemic issues in terms of sort of imperialism in the target language. And then there are systemic issues in the source language in terms of lack of lack of support. So I'm currently part of this group called Arab Voices and we're trying to copy LTI and we're making a brochure for the Frankfurt Book Fair. None of us, like, I'm not sure any of us are gonna get paid on the committee. Uh, it's being uh, organized by this super wonderful Egyptian publisher. Um, uh, <laughs> probably the translations will all be done for free. Uh, I don't even know, is the book, it's the booklet going to be distributed? I mean, and then we were hoping also that there would be uh, some kind of translation fund for it attached to these uh, 24 books that we're going to put in this booklet. Um, currently, there's no translation fund for Arabic like there is for, for, for you know, uh, certain other languages. Um, so there, there are all kinds of difficulties. Um, on multiple sides of, uh, of this. And I wanted to ask actually too, so for Arabic literature, there's this sort of uh, additional gate uh, or, or difficulty of breaking in if you have an Arab name. So you can be, uh, you can be Lina Munzer, you can be the best, uh, you can be Yasmin Zuhki, but you still have this, you have still an, your, your name is not 
Um, now, Humphrey Davies is also like an amazing translator, but your name is not, you know, Bob Smith, which gives you this additional credibility because Bob Smith must be really good with English, I guess. Um, does this also exist, Paige, with, with Korean as well? Yeah, I think a lot of what you spoke to, I can definitely see parallels in my experience so far. Um, I think Korean is one of the languages I would say is, is definitely well supported um, within the context of the source language. I think Korea is very supportive and incredibly dedicated to getting more readers in, in all languages and not just support for English, but you know, LTI Korea support has a translation fund for several languages. I know there have been translations into Turkish, French, you know, they really do have the resources and like pull the resources well. And so I think my struggles so far in translating from Korean to English are coming from the more systemic or more kind of structural issues within um, publishing, which is, you know, not immune to right issues of imperialism and imperialist influence or, or racism. And I think definitely I'm less likely to be taken seriously as a translator than, you know, someone who emails anybody, you know, on the US end or the Korean end with a name like Bob Smith. Um, I think that that uh, it definitely, it allows for those, the abundance of resources that exist to tend to kind of fall into a lot of the same hands a lot of the time, which narrows you know, just how many people are able to, yeah, enter this already marginalized group and already incredibly small group, um, which I think we should be doing as much as we can to bring more people in and, you know, have more people interested in reading and sharing Korean literature. Um, but a lot of those barriers just there's, there's an investment in maintaining them. And I think that's the most important thing is to really open open up the definition of a translator and open up our understandings of what translators look like and the work that we do uh, so that yeah more people can enter these spaces and I think yeah it would be wonderful to see translation funds exist for every language I would love to be reading more literature in every language and it's often it comes down to just the concrete means you know the concrete funding support the structural support for the work um, I think yeah, Korean definitely has a lot of those resources, but I think we, I mean, yeah, we can still be doing a lot more to diversify who's translating and take seriously the the translators of color, especially. And um, I think also, you know, heritage language speakers tend to be discredited um, or their work is not taken as seriously either or is praised or lauded. Um, and so I think all of those are issues that need to be dealt with at the same time as the the kind of concrete uh, financial issues as well. Right. And I, I guess I, I'd imagine there's also an issue of transparency as well, because I just know that Bob Smith is being paid more per word than everybody else in the industry. And and, yeah. and just those, we don't know. I mean, I you do I do know how much Bob Smith is being paid but I don't know what those different levels are and how to negotiate better yeah, and I don't think that a lot men, most people don't know I mean there is transparency is a really good um thing to bring up but I think and, and I you know for instance like the pen translation committee has done a lot of work in and of advocacy and I personally have done a lot of work with them advocating for translators and for us to have better terms and standards in the industry but but I think I mean, there's so many things to talk about here, but one of the things also I wanted to bring up is sort of like bring, like enabling the sort of inspiration for some of these, you know, like MLQ, you were talking about, you know, you, you, you find something you want to translate, you translate it, you find a place to publish it, you're a translator. But, you know, since we're all, since translation is so sort of solitary, sometimes we are working in isolation and we don't even consider these other things that we might be able to do. Like as a, as a for instance, I'll talk about uh, Strong Women Soft Power. What, you know, we've written articles together, we've done readings together, but uh, back in 2017, we organized a day long symposium that took place in Tokyo. We did it in Tokyo because we, our target was, our market, our audience was Jap people translating into and out of Japanese. And so obviously, that was the place to do it. 
but we weren't funded. We did this, we didn't really, we, we weren't, we didn't have any funding or support. We did it ourselves. But the idea, you know, the basis was we wanted to talk about community. We wanted to bring people together. We wanted to talk about some of these barriers or um, stereotypes that exist within publishing. So we had, you know, different uh, panels organized and we, we brought together all of these people. And I think, you know, it wasn't, in the mainstream, at, you know, the fact that three people living on different continents could put something like this together. And we weren't funded, like I said, we weren't funded, we didn't have, you know, an academic institution or a governmental institution uh, supporting us. So we had, you know, there was, you know, we were scrap, you know, scrambling and scrapping things together. But at the same time, there was a certain amount of freedom. And like, uh, expansiveness in terms of what could be possible and it was a, it was a tremendous success we were covered in the japan times you know we had uh, and i think out of that conver the conversations that took place that day we inspired other groups to form their own collectives or to take up their own you know kinds of work literary or translation workshops and things and so sometimes it's just like this suggesting what's possible um, and I'm, I know, I knew that this was going to happen. I'm looking at the time. It's, uh, <laughs> it's time. I'm hoping that we have some questions that have come in. Otherwise we can just keep asking ourselves these questions, but, uh, I knew we would just kind of scratch the surface of, uh, all of the things to talk about here. Um, so yes, I think that Marianne has a question, um, and she's coming back. Yes. And there she is. Hello. <clears throat> I have many, many questions for the <laughs> conversation. But the first one um, came from Paige, uh, Paige's first intervention because um, I, I find the, the notion of creating a community through a blog really interesting and, and the nature of the blog, which was, you know, transnational. Um, so I wondered if you would give us an example of some insight that you derived from through the blog on the trans, translational transnational connection, something that, you know, that really struck you. And I, and I, I think everybody, perhaps you could all give us an example of how your community has somehow, you know, given, given you some, some special experience. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I think, yeah, definitely uh, everyone who was kind of on the, the founding team also participated directly in editing a lot of the pieces that came in. And, and by editing, I don't mean um, in the stricter publishing sense, but just sort of curating and seeing how things fit together. Um, and a lot of those pieces I remember, um, I think that just in general, getting to hear from people who sort of saw the challenge of the blog and took it upon themselves to also ask questions about how their own language shapes their identity and vice versa, how their identity shapes the way that they use language was really interesting to see um, because I was obviously coming to it from the standpoint of, you know, an American who moves to Korea and now has a lot of questions about what I'm doing here and, and how I'm doing here. Um, but I got to read a lot of pieces from writers on the other end of that. And I'm thinking of my co-founder, Eugene Lee, um, who is a Korean American, um, often grappling on the blog with um, issues around sort of living in the US without a concrete sense of what that identity meant. And then now being in the context of Korea where, you know, he is expect certain things are expected of him and among them is like a certain um, skillfulness with the language. Mm -hmm. um, and so he wrote a lot about kind of understanding his identity through maybe the ways that language often fails him in Korea, but also the ways that um, that expectation sort of changes the stakes uh, for him when it comes to speaking Korean or using Korean. Um, I think just pieces like that really uh, you know, obviously I'm coming to the language from a completely different standpoint, but I think that just asking questions about like how much of our daily identities is informed by language um, was something I took away from the blog and questions I still, you know, grapple with when I'm working in translation now, which is really cool. 
Thank you, Paige. That is really cool. Um, we have another question from Avery Udagawa. Uh, that is, you guys have all skirted around it, but I think it's good to address it directly. And I'm sure you'll each have a different response. Um, Avery asks, how do you organize and sustain a translator community without it becoming overwhelmed? How do you encourage others to help shoulder your burden as an organizer and activist? Um, I think Avery knows very well that I don't, so I'll pass. <laughs> <laughs> no, please answer the question. Thank you. <laughs> I haven't the slightest idea. I mean, the so the organization that I'm in with Avery is called World Kid Lit. And I think actually that group has done a far better job than Arab Lit in terms of um, establishing uh, a core um, committee that, it, that works together and that shares things together, has a regular, now we're, we're supposed to have a monthly Zoom call together that we, so that we, so that there's not one person that, um, who is really kind of uh, silently doing uh, many things that nobody else even knows about. Um, so I think with with that with with that I think spreading out somehow into into some kind of system, whatever it is, uh, is helpful. Yeah, I think um, from my experience, I guess it would actually come from my experience when I was co-chair of the translation committee. One of the things that I learned from that, you know, you have this group of people who are coming together and lots of people have different ideas or um, aspirations or ambitions for what, what they might like to see. And again, I think sometimes it's just about empowering people to recognize like, you know, if this is something you want to happen, you can start working towards that goal yourself. You know, you don't necessarily need, you know, we'll support you. And so I think, I think that has a lot to do with the community of just sort of like bringing, bringing, you know, letting people um, have their vision and then supporting them to, I mean, I, I do understand, I, I know very well from working with Esther on <laughs> translating the future, how it can be very overwhelming, but, um, but, the translation community is also, they are very willing to uh, to lend their support and help, I think. Um, I just wanted to kind of go back to uh, Marianne's, I wanted to have my own chance to sort of respond a little bit to one of the things, to what Marianne was asking earlier. And I think um, obviously community is about coming together and supporting each other, but I think like the two collectives that I'm a part of, you can kind of see, like one of them is all various languages and so, you would see that we're sort of supporting literature and translation, but with the Japanese translators coming together, and I know like there are other groups, there are other like Smoking Tigers, I know is a Korean, uh, a collective of Korean translators. Um, I know this because Alta, we did this relay blog on Alta last year that uh, we interviewed each other. And, um, but I think as one of the questions that comes up with um, communities who are translating the same language uh, pairs, you might think that there's like competition that you think, oh, well, you know, other, you know, like I'm competing with Ginny and Lucy for the same work. But the reality is that we're not that, I mean, first of all, we're sharing resources, we're sharing information. And so that helps to sort of buoy us up. But it's also that like a rising tide lifts all ships, I think. And the, the idea that if you're working together, somehow it creates more work more opportunities. And I just wanted to, to make sure that I feel like that's certainly been my experience. And I wanted to share that with other people, because if you're, if that's, if that's keeping you from, from working together with your fellow translators, don't let it, please. We have a really good follow up on that question, actually. Um, in creating your own initiatives, uh, it seems obvious that having a source of dollars or money to pay participants would be desirable. Are there other specific things you want or need for your projects that institutional support might offer? I mean, obviously money is in funding is, is the most, but I mean, a, a platform for publishing things is, you know, in, extremely valuable. Even in this exact moment, having uh, someone like HowlRound, 
you know, having a media platform who's going to help because there are a lot of technical considerations that literary translators probably don't know very much about. So there are very, you know, the Brookline Booksmith, you know, bookstores. I mean, that's another thing that, you know, I was so um, attracted to and, and just awed by what Shuchi did with the transnational series is that, you know, I found as I was learning to, as I was having books being published and wanting to participate in the promotion of them, is that like a lot of bookstores were not considering, they didn't consider inviting the translator, even like book groups, they'll do book groups and they'll they'll select your book, but obviously they can't invite the, the writer who's living in Japan or Morocco or Lebanon or so they're going, but they don't invite the translator. And so I was finding that like, you have to sort of reinvent the wheel every time you wanted to do a an event promoting a book or books in translation. And so the fact that Chuchi's sort of establishing this format was really helpful, not just in Brookline, Massachusetts, but also as a sort of template that other bookstores could use. So, it, you know, that's the kind of in-kind support that I think is, can be offered. Chuchi, do you want to respond as well? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's, as far as you, we don't, we don't actually, we've never paid our, um, our speakers. Um, everybody who's coming in is promoting a book. Um, and so they're on tour from publishers. Um, and so that has, has been really challenging because we want to invite people and it's how do we, how do we get people, people to come because it is, it is labor. Um, yeah, so, I mean, I don't really have anything to add other than um, then that I think that that financial bit of it is is always is always sort of a struggle. Um, and you know, how do we how do we make sure people understand that this is this is valuable work and that their time is valued. Um, and that even as a bookstore when we're asking them to come and we are, you know, in kind of publishing, uh, you know, promoting their book, that we also value that work that they're, we're doing, even if we can't pay them. I mean, I think that's a really that's a really big challenge, um, definitely for independent bookstores. Um, but I think in the industry in general, um, is that kind of financial compensation that proves a worth, you know? Um, yeah. I have one quick question. I don't know um, if we have time for it, but English is an issue. I, when uh, MLQ was speaking, you were talking about how through ArabLit.org, um, Italian publishers were seeing Arabic works. So I'm wondering, on the one hand, English is an issue because it's really hard to break down that door. But on the other hand, through your communities, do other people find literature in it because you're translating into English? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, a Greek translator just told me she watched the interview oh that she watched the interview that i did with lissy jacquette for uh, for the jordi festival and now she's going to translate yeah. <laughs> right into, into Greek. oh that's amazing so uh and uh arab lit is often articles spe specific pieces are translated to to spanish uh, to french to italian um at least once once a week into into some uh and there are a number of sort of spin-off sites there's a an arabic literature in spanish there's an arabic literature in, in Italian site um, uh, as well. So, so uh, you know, uh, uh, there was a, a, a book that I felt very passionate about and translated the whole thing without having a publisher for. It's finally coming out uh, in October, but um, for a while, the sort of the only fruit of it was that, that the author was able to show it to European publishers who were then interested in it based on that. So wow. English, English can be a door, but it, it also can create opportunities in other languages. And, and does that happen in Korean as well, Paige? I'm still too new to say with any certainty <laughs> on my end, but, <laughs> but I think definitely just given the scope and the support um, that I mentioned, like LTI Korea and other foundations have, I think definitely, you know, English is not seen as sort of the only option for translating from Korean. And I think that, you know, while many of the into English translations can sort of open up more readers to an interest in Korean literature, I think, you know, 
it's Korean is in a really interesting position where a lot of that interest is pretty close by. Um, I think there's a lot of like interaction between, you know, Korean literature and Japanese literature, Korean literature and Russian literature. And I think that's interesting to watch from, you know, my standpoint working, not working from those languages, but thinking it's just really admirable that those connections are already there. And I would love to see similar platforms spring up. Um, yeah, something like ArabLit.org or other platforms for, you know, fostering those connections too. Uh, we have one more question for these last few minutes um, or last minute uh, that I think is really pertinent. Um, it's from the UK and the questioner would like to ask all the panelists if they think the established translators associations in the US and UK can do more to remove barriers to entry and welcome a more diverse range of voices into their community. Um, what do you all think about that? I mean, to, to me, it would be, it'd have to be about, uh, from where I am, about removing citizenship as, or residency as a barrier. So they'd have to say, we're open to everybody, even if you are a Moroccan living in Morocco, even if you are a, a Syrian living in, in Berlin, even whoever you are, if you translate in these languages, we are open to you. And, and, and currently, I think these institutions really are for people who live there. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I mean, I think, no, I, I mean, I'm speaking more for, um, well, the American ones. I think that they, um, I think they are working hard to reach outside of the sort of obvious community, you know, not communities, but where people are. And I think, I think it's just, I think it's, I'm seeing more and more, um, outreach happening, but I think it's, it's, it's something that we always need to keep foremost in our mind, so. All right, well, I think we've reached 11 a.m., which is, alas, the moment when we have to say goodbye to each other. This has been an extraordinary conversation. Um, it's been fantastic to get so many different perspectives from so many different places, um, and, uh, really enlightening as well, I think, uh, for myself and many people in the audience. So uh, as we say goodbye, uh, we need to thank once again our partners, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities, the Graduate Center CUNY, the Common Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. And today in particular, the Middlebury Language Schools, and LTI Korea for their generous support for today's event. And especially thank you to Shuchi, Allison, MLQ, and Paige. Uh, this has been an extraordinary conversation. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. <laughs>